Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining me on the Slice of Healthcare podcast. I'm your host, Jared Taylor. Joining me today is Kira Radinsky, the CEO and CTO at Diagnostic Robotics. How are you today, Kira? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm doing well. You are, I mean, I know you are, the first CEO and CTO to come on the podcast that we've had. Uh, So when you dive into your background in just a second, I really would love to hear more about that because I know there's interesting, you know, uh, parts to each of those jobs uh, that that you're definitely dealing with. But tell us a little bit about your background as we start this conversation here today. Awesome. Uh, so quickly about myself, I was born in Kiev, Ukraine, uh, immigrated uh, to Israel when I was about uh, four and uh, started studying in university when I was 15, mostly focusing on machine learning when it still was less popular. Uh, started my PhD, mostly focusing on how I can take everything in energy road for the last 150 years and build AI systems who can read all of this, identify patterns in history and predict future events. I've worked in Microsoft Research. I was involved in building their search engine. And in parallel, I was building those systems for predicting future events with the Gates Foundation and others predicted the first cholera outbreak in Cuba in 130 years, the Sudan riots in 2013. I then started a company using similar technology to predict economic events for B2B companies, sold my company to eBay, being their chief scientist from Israel for a few years. And a few years back, I started uh, Diagnostic Robotics together with Professor Moshe Shon. Not too many people can say acquired by eBay. So congrats on on that huge win uh, years back. And very, even fewer people can say, I mean, uh, you said you started university at 15. Yeah. And it comes back eventually to why am I a CEO and CDO? So first of all, if somebody would def- ask me who I, who I am, I would say, first of all, I'm a scientist. So everything I do in my life has to be all pretty much based on facts, science and discoveries. That's who I am from the inside. So even in my role, uh, although I'm leading the company from an executive role, still in my heart, I'm the technologist. Interesting. Okay. It, it, so talk us through, though. Obviously, each each role comes with different challenges. Uh, let, let's go through, too. Like, which role do you, uh, I guess, how do you how do you spend your time, right, between those two roles? Obviously, uh, there, there's a mix, and I'm sure it differs on a, a day-to-day, but... Give, give us a breakdown of, uh, of kind of a, a day in the life of Kira in, in two, you know, very, very strenuous roles. Uh, if anyone can do it, you can. Uh, but I know our audience would love to hear more about that. All right. So let's start with Sundays. Although Sundays are weekends, I spend them in the university. I have a team of 10 PhD students and we do everything from actually building AI systems to predict how to generate molecules to deliver RNAs to the correct part of the body. So I actually work with chemists who actually build the molecules our AI is generating, to digital health and automated EKG recorders. Uh, on normal week, uh, weekdays, I spend the mornings with the tech teams who actually build the technology, review algorithms, make sure that things work. And then at night, I work with the United States, actually working with customers, making sure that our sales and marketing is driving the, the right amount of business for the company and making sure that our go-to-market is excelling. So... Um, yeah. So in the mornings, I'm a CTO. At night, I'm a CEO. I like it. Um, that is that is quite a hectic day on a, on a day-to-day basis. How, how does predictive AI population health, you know, help providers and payers with chronic, uh, you know, condition management? So my passion in general was always, how can we predict future events? And for years, I've been thinking about how do I bring in a more personalized level? So we started Diagnostic Robotics, where we focus on how we can take 60 billion historical visits of physicians with patients coming in from both claims data, medical records, ADTs, all forms of data, and eventually predict for which patients we can know if they're going to deteriorate. But even more important, we can still prevent it. Using all this information, we build a completely actionable system that not only tells you who's going to deteriorate, but Can we save them and with what action and build the entire proactive workflow? And I think the pretty cool part is that we've been talking in healthcare, specifically in emergency departments, about triaging. When a patient is in problem, how do you actually triage and know who's at most risk? Very few were thinking about how do we bring triage into primary care in general? And even more than this, how do we bring triage into preventive care? 
And that's a lot of the things that we've been doing. I'll give you an example. Uh, we've been building a system to predict which patients that have congestive heart failure will deteriorate. The usual uh, way of working is let's take the most expensive ones and focus on them. The biggest problem is, well, the fact that they're expensive means nothing about our ability to proactively save them. And even if we know, what will be the action? So we really ran a, a treatment control trial and we saw that our system is identifying members who are recently identified with CHF and offering them dietary consulting, as opposed to more regular algorithms that were focusing on the more expensive ones that had like CHF and CPD and more for more than 50 years. I'll give you another example. The coolest things the AI identifies is really unexpected patterns. For example, it identified that patients were doing a lot of different tasks, like an MRI on their back and then on their knees and then on their hips. So a lot of entropy in the tests, those patients are with high probability undiagnosed depression. And if they have undiagnosed depression and a chronic condition, high probability they're gonna stop taking the medication. So the intervention the system actually said they need to be doing is talking to a psychologist and doing all of the PHQ-9s, actually identifying their psychological situation as opposed to physical. Uh, all of the things I've been telling you about, uh, we've been able to show almost $1,600 PM PM savings by preventing almost two inpatient visits per patient per year on average. Wow. And, and I mean, it's just, it's going to continue to improve, right? I, it just the fact that I you're already so. there, though, is, is, is incredible. You know, I was really excited to talk to you, Kara, too, because, you know, with your past experience and then what you're doing now with diagnostic robotics, I, I like to use this phrase with some people uh, that you were leveraging AI before it was, you know, cool, before it was popular. Uh, now you see all these pitch decks that they throw in chat GPT because it's been talked about in the news and everyone on the on the street. Um how, based on your past experience too, right, in, in the company that was acquired by eBay and what you were studying, uh, why healthcare, uh, first off, because it obviously, um, I, I always say people don't just, many people don't just decide, I'm going to start in healthcare, right? I actually get really excited by the people who didn't start in healthcare and then try to take those learnings and apply it to healthcare and then par partner up, right, with the people that have spent their whole careers in healthcare to, to try to innovate. Um, I would like to focus in on like how do these past experiences help in building diagnosis robotics and you know how do they help get the outcomes that you're already at today? So I'll tell you what I thought and then uh, what I discovered. So first of all, uh, being in healthcare was my uh, like a dream since I was four. I always wanted to do computer science and analysis. And then I will, all, always wanted to do some research in biology and medicine, etc. cetera. Um, but with time, I got more excited about the algorithmic part. Uh, even more than this, everything I was doing in research, the predictions that we're making made me extremely more excited to predict a pandemic or at that time epidemics, as opposed to predicting the next economic events. And I really understood the impact that we're doing and the satisfaction that it brought and the lives it saved, as opposed to, let's say, uh, better enhancements to all of those large scale systems I've been building in advertisement, etc. When I came into healthcare, I thought that the biggest thing is going to be the algorithmic improvements. This is why we even named the company Diagnostic Robotics. I thought that we're going to be building a system that produces decision support system with diagnostics. This is where I understood that healthcare, we're a little bit a few steps before. We really need to understand the data. We need to create holistic patient views. Uh, a lot of the things that we thought before about applying AI is pretty much the next steps and that we need to start from the beginning. Uh, from my past experience, what usually works when I work with B2B companies, you can have the most amazing algorithms, but if it's not in the workflow of the physician, or in my case, the user in my previous experience, it's never going to work. So there's a lot of things that are very similar. Here we integrate into different EMR systems, making sure that the patients and physicians see this at the right time. Um, but I would say in the, this is the first time that I actually had to develop algorithms which are causal as opposed to a mainstream correlation mining um, and performing uh, almost um, very slow EB testing on small control groups, uh, which pretty much requires much different statistics than what we were doing before. And, you know, in, in part of, by the way, I wanted to dive into this, part of um, in, in what you're building, right, um, you're helping to reduce things like data bias, uh, which is always 
it, it's it seems to be a term that we hear even more today, right? Because we're we have so much more data uh, that we have access to today. Uh, how do you? What are some of the ways you're reducing like data bias in, you know, in order to improve like healthcare equity or something like? Like, would love to hear your thoughts on that as well. So let's first understand where is bias coming from in machine learning, right? So bias can come in different forms. It mostly comes either either the labels are biased or the way we model the problem is biased. So specifically in uh, 2019, there was a very interesting science paper on proactive care. They took a very well-known algorithm used by all of the common companies, the leading companies, who predicts which patients will be expensive. And they actually show that this algorithm is ranking the white population always higher than the Afro-American population. And the reasoning behind the scene was they were modeling cost. I'll explain. Historically, the Afro-American population used the healthcare system less. And therefore, the model predicted they will continue using it less and be less expensive as opposed to the other population. And they showed it doesn't matter how many diseases they have. We all agree this is wrong. And from a bias perspective, we should assume that different populations should be ranked based on their prevalence uh, in the population as opposed to just based on their race. So how do you fix this? First of all, Predicting cost of patients is just literally the wrong thing to do. You need to predict their clinical events so you can take action. So for the first thing we've done is predicting the right thing. The second thing we've done is, first of all, seeing that we do not take cost into account so we can focus on the clinical side. So every time they ask me, are you doing AI in healthcare? I'm saying, no, I built a clinical AI system who identified the cause and effect between an intervention and the probability of a patient of actually deteriorating. The second piece that we're doing, we have an algorithmic approach that goes through all possible combination. For example, women of a certain height and weight, are they being treated differently from the prevalence in the population and check statistically if all of those things are done differently. We've been collaborating uh, with uh, leaders in that field to make sure that we deploy those systems uh, in practice and build uh, verification of other machine learning algorithms to not be biasing. It's so interesting. you know. The way you, by the way, the way you answer questions is, I could listen to you answer these questions all day. Um, you're, you're so, not not that like, I, I get the opportunity to, to speak with so many, you know, brilliant people in, in healthcare and beyond. Um, you have a very, I, I just want to say you have a very relaxing uh, tone too. So I'm really excited for for our audience to, to tune in to, to hearing more about you and diagnostic robotics. Um I want to I want to focus a little bit on on what the future is for for you and the in the company. Talk us through where you see Diagnostic Robotics heading. I mean, this is we're almost halfway, or no, we're only a quarter of the way through uh, 2023 right now. But uh, talk us through, you know, where you see the company heading in 2023 and beyond. Yeah. So till today, we've been working with uh, leading peers uh, in the United States, from large national ones to more regional ones. All in all, we've been uh, reviewing 28 million patients monthly and being in charge of hundreds of millions of dollars of costs that are being managed through the system. But one of the things that I was always excited about is how do we bring those systems directly to physician groups and physicians in their actual care? So in the last uh, year, we've been working directly with physicians, deploying those systems, specifically with physicians who are bearing risk, bringing all of the best practices that we've been working with payers for the last years, and this time bringing it in a fair chance with a clinical impact. From an algorithmic perspective, I always say that uh, we're really excited, as you mentioned, from ChatGPT and all of those exciting large language models. What I'm excited about is Let's say a few years ago, when we were building the search engine, the way we built this, we had a lot of scientists write hypotheses, and then a machine learning model will take all of our hypotheses, give it different weights, and this is how we built the search engine. So we'd say 400 PhDs write 40,000 hypotheses. I'm not kidding you. And the machine learning model would rank it based on historical information. The biggest problems that we've happened in the last few years, we moved to deep learning approaches. In other words, systems that we can no longer interpret which patterns they're using behind the scene and what are the hypotheses they're testing. And even more than this, we started looking at how do we take simulators, let's say a simulator of a body, and we add it to a deep learning model. So from a future perspective is, how do I add more better modeling and understanding of the human body into our predictions? So we can not only tell you what is the proactive protocol, 
but I actually build much better explanations into it and tying it back to all of those studies and hundreds of millions of papers being published in the last hundreds of years. Super interesting. I, I'm so excited for you and, and, and where the company will, will be heading. And I hope we can stay in touch to have you come back on and maybe get on a panel with some others and we can dive more into, uh, you know, AI just in, in general, but also what's what's continuing uh, for diagnostic robotics and, and all the success that I know that uh, you will have in this space. But well, I really so appreciate you. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast, sharing your story, uh, making everyone want to, uh, I mean, the, the 15 year, uh, being at university at 15 too, and your story is, uh, it's, it's so, it's so great for people to hear and get them excited and get them to want to, you know, maybe push, push themselves a little bit more. I, we also have some people that are in school, right. That listen to the show and I hope they can hear your story and get really excited and, and know that, um, you know, you can continue pushing forward and creating something truly special, even at uh, a very early age. Thank you, Jared.